consider. Amen. So we're going to start today by, by reading uh, the Word of God together, and um, I'm going to have them on the screen. Uh, the title of the message is Holy, and um, it's, it's a two-part message, and I, I truly believe it's going to work in tandem with the fast, actually, um, because it's going to call, cause us to, to search our hearts and to allow God to search our hearts um, and, and to change us and make us more like Him. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 2. Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Chapter 20 and verse 7. Um, Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord, your God. Uh, uh, Leviticus 21 and verse 8. Therefore you shall consecrate him. Uh, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you. For I am the Lord who sanctify you. Am holy. And Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6. And it says. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. And a holy nation. And maybe we could read 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13 to 16 together. And this is really the foundational verse. Uh, our passage for this chapter. Um, if we can get it up on the screen there. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. You may be seated. Be holy, for I am holy. God has given us a simple but direct command, um, and, and it applies to all who follow him, and it is, be holy. And, and I think it's important to understand, this is a command, not a suggestion. One that applies to all who follow him. It's not an optional extra in the service of God, but it's an absolute prerequisite, because we don't follow God on our terms we must follow him on his. And he says to be holy. Uh, and, and again, I think it's interesting to bear in mind that he doesn't say be happy or be healthy, as important as those are, but he does say be holy. And, and again, I'm not saying the others aren't important, but it does seem clear that God places great importance on holiness. Um, Psalm 93 and verse 5, your testimonies are very sure, holiness adorns your house, O Lord, forever. And that word in the Hebrew is uh, kadash, and it means sacred, ceremonially or morally. It means God, an angel, a saint, a sanctuary, a holy one. And it comes from kadash, which means to make or pronounce clean or ceremonially or morally. And again, I think both go together. Um, it, it means to appoint, to dedicate, to hallow, to be or to keep holy. It means a holy place. It means to keep, prepare, purify, sanctify, holy. And so there's an almost otherworldly um, uh, feel to this word, our, our concept of holiness. And, and this is why, uh, you know, as I proceed, I want to make the distinction between um, positional holiness and practical holiness. Because when you get saved, you're holy in a positional sense. The very moment you give your life to Jesus, you are holy. Colossians 1.22, in the body of his flesh, true death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, the NIV. But now he has reconciled you by God, by Christ's physical body, true death, to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. And the New Living, it says, Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. 
And so that's how God sees you, is holy and blameless in his sight. And so because of Christ and the cross, we have been declared holy in God's eyes. We are holy in a positional sense. And yet you may still be unholy in a practical sense. In that there may still be many areas in your life um, where God wants to change you and make you more like him. Now, that alone will set some of you free from shame, condemnation, and, and despair. Uh, you know, the realization that God is working on you. So say it today, God is not finished with me yet. Finished with Amen? He's working. And so... I appreciate in our modern world, there is a coarseness and a vulgarity that has, you know, crept into our society and none of us are exempt from its corrosive um, effects. Um, you know, it's in our music, you know, Sam Smith recorded a song um, called Unholy and it's, it's so perverted that, you know, I couldn't possibly play it here, but it's, it's received over a billion streams online, um, uh, you know, over the last year. Uh, you look at TV or movies, um, social media, or, or just the internet, uh, you know, the, the number three, the, the three top internet uh, sites are uh, YouTube, um, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Google. And uh, number four and number five are pornographic um, uh, search, search um, uh, sites, or, or, yeah, uh, pornographic sites. And... Um, I googled that, I didn't check it personally, but that is, um, it is very, very pervasive um, uh, online, and, um, and so it's even come into our politics, and so talking about this subject of, of being holy seems almost ridiculous, and so you could ask the question, is holiness uh, redundant? You know, a leftover from, from previous generations that weren't enlightened by the sexual revolution. Or the question is, is holiness a kingdom principle that we have neglected or forgotten and, and one that has kept us from intimacy with God and influence with men and has left the church in, in a place of relative ineffectiveness. Um, and, and so when you consider previous moves of God and, and what God has done in the past, I mean, I think any honest person would have to admit that we are far from where we need to be. It's like Gideon when the angel of God appeared to him in Judges chapter 6. The first thing Gideon said, well, if God is with us, where are all the miracles? I mean, I got saved in, in the early 90s, and I, I'll be quite honest, I believe there was a much more powerful move of God back then than what we're seeing right now. And so I believe there is so much more. There is so much more. And even, you know, driving around Oklahoma, and I, I mean, I, I really was so blessed. I mean, apparently some, somewhere in the region of 80% of the people claim to be evangelical Christians, but there are churches everywhere, and the people are so sweet, so nice. Really, I met some of the nicest people um, over the last week. Uh, but, but, you know, it's also that realization God is no respecter of persons. And so, you know, what he's done in Africa or South America or North America or any other nation, Great Britain that has seen a move of God, what he has done there, he can do here. What he's done in the past, he can do now in Jesus' name. If we will press in and take it by faith. That's why I would encourage you, come next Friday night, you know, to the prayer meeting. And it's going to be in the ringside, and uh, I believe it's going to be powerful in Jesus' name. 2024, we need to pray. We need to press. We need to pray and press in and take what God has for us. Because the Bible says, the kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And then it's time to take it, whatever it is, whether it's healing or deliverance or provision or whatever you need. Listen, some of you don't want to be renting for the rest of your life. You need your own home. Could somebody say amen? amen? It's time to take it in Jesus' name. It's time for us to take a church building by faith. It's time for us to take, you know, the destiny that God has for us. And I believe prayer is absolutely key to that. But holiness is also another key, I believe, that the church has overlooked because I'm convinced that many times we're waiting on God when God is waiting on us. Waiting on us to truly surrender to his Holy Spirit to do a deep sanctifying work in our hearts and in our homes. 
Amen? He wants to do sanctifying work, not just in your heart, but in your home, in Jesus' name. And so I think it's important for us, you know, to, to, to grasp what God wants to do. Because if we allow His Holy Spirit to work in us and on us and through us, then I believe the very first thing that He will do is make us holy, or rather deal with the sin in our lives. And like I said, you can be positionally holy and yet have all sorts of bondages in your life. I'm a pastor. I know this. I know people that have been Christians for 30 years and yet they're still addicted to drugs or porn or lying or bad language or gossip or unforgiveness or all sorts of issues. So like I said, I, I think it's important to understand this is a very important subject. Hosea 10 and verse 12 says, Sow to yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground because it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness on you because there is no repentance without revival. And there is no revival without repentance. Understand, the two go together. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, speaking of Jesus. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So clearly, the Bible says you cannot run your race unless you're willing to strip yourself of those weights and of those sins that are holding you back. Amen? And so... Um, I truly believe the Spirit of God is calling us in this season to lay some things aside. Weights, bondages, habits, limitations. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I taught like a child. I taught like a child. I, 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 I talked like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. This is, a, this is a time, you know, we're standing at the start of the year. This is a time for some of you to put away some childish things. Some of you have a childish tendency to take offense. Oh, the pastor didn't talk to me. Well, maybe I didn't see you or maybe I had another thousand things on my mind. It's not personal. Or, 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 or you, you know, you're getting offended in your job or you're, you, you know, getting your feelings hurt. Well, nobody, you know, praised me for what I did there. Well, then why are you doing it? Are you doing it for God? Or are you doing it for man? The Bible says that they love the praise of man more than the praise of God in the Gospel of John. I don't want to be one of those people. Amen? So anyway, um, God is asking us to lay aside some things because Jesus Christ is coming. And we must be holy if we would be ready. We must be holy if we would be ready. Revelation 19 and 7 let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. Are you ready for heaven? Because there is nothing unholy there. And let me clarify, nothing and no one. There is nothing unholy and there is no one unholy in heaven. And that's rather sobering for us to consider. Amen, because the last unholy one to be there was Satan, and God drop kicked him out of there um, uh, when pride arose in his heart. This is why, again, the Daniel fast is, uh, at the start of a new year, is a perfect opportunity for you to deal with any childish or immature areas in your life. Yes, of course, our flesh doesn't like it, not having a coffee and not having, you know, whatever, sugar dumplings or whatever you have for breakfast. I'm just saying... But it's, it's dealing with your flesh. Your flesh doesn't like it. But the Bible says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And, and, and so, it's, like I said, sometimes we're waiting on God to do something in our lives. He's waiting on us to draw close to him. And so, uh, it, 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 the fast is an opportunity to deal with some areas. Laziness, unforgiveness, bitterness, bad attitudes, gossip. Like I said, a tendency to take offense or pride. And let me say this. If you feel exempt from the temptation to fall into pride, then you are proud already. It's like the man who was given a medal for being uh, humble, the most humble person in the, the church, and they had to take the medal off him because he wore it. <laughs> uh, that was from Derek Prince, but I think it's a great illustration. Um, and, and so it's time to put away childish things. Childish ways of thinking, acting, and responding. God wants us to mature. It's time to grow up before we go up. Amen? How many of you want God to touch your life? And you should. That's about a quarter of you. Okay. Hallelujah. But if a holy God touches your life, what do you think he will do to you? 
He will make you holy too. You see, we want to be like Jesus. That is our aim and our goal. And to do that, we must yield to his Holy Spirit because it's foolish uh, for us to expect God to use us but not change us. And change is always painful. You know, when I was in, well, I love walking around Walmart and I saw uh, a DVD for uh, the, all four parts of the Lethal Weapon uh, movies on Blu-ray for only $12. I was delighted, you know, because I like Mel Gibson. But, you know, I bought it and I'm, you know, it was like a day or two before I'm giving a message on, on, on being holy. <laughs> And the Spirit of God is dealing with me. You know, and it's just an action movie, but, you know, I'm sure it's full of bad language and all sorts of other things. And, um, and so, you know, I, 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 start, I started getting convicted because um, I kind of liked the 80s and that there was none of that kind of woke nonsense going on and uh, it, it, just killing everybody in sight. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes as a man, you just need that testosterone fix. Anybody with me? Nobody. Okay. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> But listen, I, I realize, you know, I can't sit there as a father and let my kids hear that language or if there's a scene that's inappropriate that may cause them to stumble. And, and so I was convicted. I, I need to take this back. And um, we were on the way to, to the airport and Mark and Cynthia were there. So I had to explain to them why I had to take it back. And, you know, so, you know, God is a way of humbling you. And, you know, the whole way I drove to, the, to Walmart, my flesh says, no. I want to watch it. <laughs> and um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> let me make a distinction between holiness and perfection. Holiness means that you are set apart, not that you are perfect. And ultimately, we're all works in progress. You see, grace is doing its work no matter where we're at. And so we can either resist or cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And some people literally have to be dragged by Jesus all the way to heaven. You know, they're just digging their heels and, no, Lord, I want this and I want that and I want the other. But you know what? We must yield to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to take out of our lives what doesn't glorify Him. Ephesians 4 and verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed to the day of redemption, the new living. And do not bring sorrow to God's Spirit by the way you live. Think about that. We can bring sorrow to God's Spirit by the way we live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. And I like the Amplified, um, uh, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not offend or vex or sadden him, by whom you are sealed, marked, branded as God's own, secured for the day of redemption, of final deliverance, true Christ, from evil and the consequences of sin. How many of you are glad that you've been branded by God? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. You know, I'm personally mindful of the fact that I've fallen short on many occasions and many areas, but I thank God for grace. I thank God that the master is still working on me and he's still working on you. And, and, and that there's a place where we'll be fully perfected, heaven. Uh, Richard Baxter, 1615 to 1691. This life was not intended to be the place of our perfection, but the preparation for it. You see, heaven is a prepared pa place for a prepared people. And now, the easiest thing in the world is to talk about a holiness um, uh, that we don't actually live. You know, to deal with holiness in an abstract, theoretical manner, which is ultimately hypocrisy. But again, where do we ever get the idea that knowing was enough? Because knowing and obeying are two very different things. Matthew 28 and 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And that's why, again, we give our sermons on a Sunday. This is why we have Bible school. This is why we have life groups. And I would encourage you, if you're not in a life group, to join one. Because it's there that you will be taught. And, and ultimately, our teaching is that you will obey. Obey God. Obey His Word. Amen? And so, I think that's, that's important. Because... Do you know what we call a person who preaches but does not practice? Um, a Pharisee or a hypocrite. And um, that's what Jesus said of the Pharisees. They preach but they do not practice. Um, A.W. Tozer, a Pharisee is hard on others and easy on himself. But a spiritual man is easy on others and hard on himself. Are you walking the walk or like so many others, are you just talking the talk? I believe this is a day for us to not just talk holiness, but to walk 
in holiness. You see, God is calling all of us to go further and to go deeper. James H. Oh, he said this, God brings men into deep waters, not to drown them, but to cleanse them. Praise you, Jesus. God wants to bring you deeper this year, not to take all of the fun away or to condemn you, but rather, he wants you to go further. He wants you to go deeper. He wants you to walk in his presence and his peace and in his blessing. In 2024, God is calling all of us deeper. And this is why, like I said, consider the 21-day fast or the 14 or 7, depending on where you're at. It won't kill you, but it will cleanse you physically on one level, but it will also do something in your heart and your home spiritually. And now, talking of holiness, some of you may be sitting here deeply discouraged. Pastor, I've tried. Believe me, I have tried to live a holy life, but that woman sitting next to me. She tests me, pastor. It's like one pastor, like one, not pastor. One, one man said to me, I think my wife was sent to test me. I, said, I don't think that's a good confession. And I don't think that's why God gives you a wife. But that woman next to me, now where did I hear that before? Genesis 3 and verse 12, the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Pastor, my wife just won't let me alone. She cracks me up. She, she, I'm just doing so well being holy and then she gets me into the flesh. Well, I'm sure the feeling is probably mutual. But please continue, my friend. Fact is, Pastor, we had an argument on the way to church today. She just can't seem to leave me alone. Of course, you're her little project. (laughs) She's called to perfect you, even if it kills you in the process. Or maybe it's not your wife or your husband. Maybe it's your boss or your kids or your mother-in-law or your your daughter-in-law. Fact is, some of you have failed So many times you have concluded that it's impossible. Let me share a secret to holiness. It is impossible without Jesus. It is impossible. We can't do it without his help. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12. Therefore, since we have such hope... We use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses put a veil over his face to the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains um, unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. If, you know, if, I, if I have one word for 2024, it's freedom. God wants us to walk in liberty and freedom in Jesus' name. That's why I love the states. It's in the air. They have such an appreciation for freedom. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being what? Transformed. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You see, God will not leave you where you are. Amen. Amen. And sometimes that may be your wife speaking to you. Of course, that is your wife speaking to you. But sometimes that's God speaking to you through your wife or through your husband. And you have to have the humility to hear And so, anyway, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You see, it's not about struggle, but surrender. It's not about legalism, but liberty. Um, Alan Redpath said this, Give up the struggle and the fight. Relax in the omnipotence of the Lord Jesus. Look up into His lovely face. And as you behold Him, He will transform you into His likeness. You do the beholding, He does the transforming. There is no shortcut to holiness. Think about that. There's no shortcut to holiness. There's no shortcut to being like Jesus. There's no shortcut to holiness any more than there's a shortcut to fitness. That's why I don't believe. 
you know, you can buy these tablets and suddenly you'll get into shape. It's like one, one man uh, it came up after the service and, uh, a, a number of years ago and he said, Pastor, because um, uh, I'd been talking about, you know, working out, looking after yourself. And he says, yeah, that, that's brilliant, Pastor. Can you lay hands on me and believe that God will? And, and uh, you know, I, I, I looked at him and I said, well, I didn't say it to him, but I just thought, you know, man, I think you could do with just maybe eating less donuts and walking more. Um, because there's, there's God's part, there's our part. And I'm not being trying to, you know, be whatever. But sometimes we're praying for God to do what only we can do ourselves. God didn't make you eat that whole chocolate cake. And, and quit blaming the devil as well. It was you, okay? It was you. Thou art the man. Wasn't that Nathan said that to David? Thou art the woman. Remember, we're responsible for our actions. So there's no shortcut to holiness. Anymore, there's a shortcut to fitness. And, and, and like I said, that's why people join gyms in January and they might turn up once and they never go again. But, you, you know, you have to make some things part of, a, of your lifestyle, part of your, how you live. Amen? And so, John 13 and 7, 17 in the Amplified, if you know these things, blessed and happy and to be envied are you if you practice them, if you act accordingly and really do them. 1 Corinthians 6.20, for you are bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. We must approach this subject not to impress or intimidate anyone. It's not to earn a blessing from God. And yes, are there blessings to walking in holiness? Absolutely. Um, of course, because for one, you'll probably live longer and your marriage will be stronger and your kids won't hate you, but that's not why we do it. We live holy because we love God. We live holy because we want to, to know God and to see God. Because Hebrews 12 and 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. So if knowing, pleasing, serving, and, and seeing God is a priority in your life, then you will live a holy life. And, and like I said, I need to make it clear at the outset that this won't be easy because you're going the opposite way of the world, but it's the only way to heaven. Isaiah 35 and 8, a highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks that road, though a fool, shall not go astray. Here the Bible talks about the highway of holiness. And Isaiah chapter 6, here we see um, Isaiah had an encounter with the Lord. And in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Remember, remind yourself of that in 2024. No matter what you face, no matter what happens, God is sitting on the throne. Amen? Stick with God. He'll stick with you in Jesus' name. Anyone, uh, it says, above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, holy Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him, of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I'm undone. Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What was the first thing that happened to Isaiah when he encountered the glory of God? He became un convicted of unholiness in his life or areas uh, of sin. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongues of the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord. Do you want to hear the voice of the Lord? Deal with unholiness in your life. People complain sometimes, well, I can never hear God's voice. Well, like I said, deal with the issues in your heart. And it's amazing how much more clearer the voice of God becomes in your life. And um, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? And then I said, here am I, send me. You see, God can't send you if you're not a prepared vessel. God can't send you if you're not a holy man or a holy woman of God. 
Doesn't matter how much you know, doesn't matter how qualified or how charismatic, and this is part of the problem, is too many times I think the church is promoted based on ability, based on qualification, uh, 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 rather than based on character, amen? We need to be men and women of character. We need to be holy men and women of God. And so Isaiah chapter 6 begins with a majestic picture where we, uh, you, you know, behold God's glorious throne and in, in all of its power and holiness. And, and we're given this brief privileged glimpse of the glory that awaits every child of God in the next life. And there's not a fat cherub in sight. Amen. Uh, I, you know, I think of over the years, you know, people that I've, uh, I've loved and lost. You know, my, my, my dad is in heaven and, you know, the man who led me to Christ is in heaven. And, you know, Jackie, our, our beloved administrator, she's in heaven now. And, um, you, you know, you always wish you had longer with people, but they don't. They're, they're uh, full of joy where they are. The Bible says, in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Fact is, you know, we shed tears in reality, uh, not so much for them, but for ourselves. Uh, because they have no more tears. They have no more sorrows or burdens. They're not sick anymore. They're not in pain anymore. You know, Reve uh, Revelation 21 talks about that. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. And so it's a beautiful hope that we have as believers to know that, you know, those who we have loved and those who have, have, have gone, that they're with the Lord and that they're in, in joy and happiness and perfection. And, and so... Uh, you know, the, part of me is a little envious of them because for them there are no more secrets, um, no more battles, no more trials. All has been revealed. Uh, there are no more questions. Billy Graham said this, heaven is real and hell is real and eternity is but a breath away. Think about that. Again, William Penn, for death is no more than a turning of us over from time to eternity. This is why we need to live holy lives because the time will come when we step out of time and we step into eternity. And the only way you can be ready for eternity is if you live a holy life. We're not saved by being holy, but if you are saved, then you will live holy. I think it's important to understand that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse uh, 12. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. You see, for those who die, the veil has been taken away and they see it clearly. There's no more secrets. No more, no more mysteries. They've seen the glory of God. They've had every burden lifted. They've been able to lay down their sword and their shield. And they have beheld him who died in their place, Jesus Christ. And that's one reason why I love pastoring, because I love people. And, um, you know, people, people fascinate me. But for, for all of our loved ones who have died, they, they know in full. They have seen the face of God. And so when I read this, this chapter in Isaiah, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated um, and I'm, I'm curious. Uh, there's a part of me wants to see beyond um, uh, this veil and see my father's house. You know, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid. In my father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I'd have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Jesus Christ is coming again and we must be ready. This is why God wants us to live a holy life. Amen. And so, uh, anyway, you know, since I was a little boy, I've, I've had a hunger to know my creator, to, to reach out and, and, and touch that world. Um, you know, to, to, I remember as a little boy having this sense of lacking something. I, I, I always wondered, is it something I've never eaten, something I've never drank? And yet I knew instinctively it wasn't. And, and yet I was conscious of this emptiness I had. And, and uh, that was from being a little boy even to the point when I was uh, 17 or 18 years of age. And I had that emptiness until that day I gave my life to Jesus. And then I knew this is what I've been looking for all my life. Amen. And I'm telling you something, this city is full of people who feel the same way. It's just they've never heard the gospel. They've never had the message of Christ presented to them. And that's why we're here. We're called to go. Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And, and this year, I'm believing that many of you are going to go outside your comfort zone. And you're going to tell people your story so that you can tell them his story. Amen. Glory to God. You're going to lead them to Christ. You're going to pray with them. You're going to minister the love of Christ to them in Jesus' name. Amen. And so something in me wasn't satisfied with dead religion and pointless ritual. And we had those things coming out of our ears in Ireland. But I wanted to connect with my creator. And um, Augustine said this, You've made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. 
You know, look at people in the world and, and all the restlessness and they're always looking for the next thing. And it's, it's tragic. You know, you look at people that are highly successful and, uh, you know, people like Conor McGregor and all of the ability and the fame and the wealth and yet it's all just so empty. It's empty without God. You know, it's interesting that according to uh, Isaiah, the first characteristic of God isn't love. Yes, God is love, absolutely. He loves you. No matter where you've been or what you've done, He loves you. And yet, the Bible doesn't say uh, in, in this chapter, the seraphim don't cry out, love, 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 or power, power, power. They cry out, holy, holy, holy. You know, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8, and it says, Revelation 4 and verse 8. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest neither day, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They say it not once, but they repeat it over and over. One word, holy. Holy. You see, God is revealing and emphasizing a crucial aspect of his being. He wants us to understand something essential about his character, and that is that he is holy. And he's not revealing that to condemn us or intimidate us, but rather because he wants us to know him. And so he shares a secret with us. I am a holy God, and those who walk with me must be holy too. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. God is holy, and we must be holy too. And, and so, I, I think it's interesting that the seraphim, uh, uh, you know, covered their faces, which is humility. They covered their feet, which is holiness. And they fly, which is the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, if you want the power of God in your life, you need to walk in humility, and you need to walk in holiness. Amen. And so, um, and I, you know, I think that's something that's lacking really in our in our narcissistic uh, generation. And I would even include within the ministry. Psalm forty six and ten: Be still and know that I am God. God as He is, not God as we might like Him to be. Yeah. Amen. And and so, you know, all of us have had our dead and our lifeless traditions um, and rituals. And um, God, uh, be still and know that I'm God. God as he is, not God as we might like him to be, or as he is sometimes presented in these meaningless, motivational pep talks that pass for sermons in many instances in the church today. We must start with the understanding that he is God and you are not. And, and you know, in, in what's becoming an increasingly immoral, confused, and unholy world, it's embarrassing, like I said, to hear ministers pull back from proclaiming the full gospel. Paul said, I did not ne neglect to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And so the question I want to ask is, are we better than Christ? Because he was very clear and unapologetic in calling mankind to repentance and faith. Mark 1 and 15, the time is come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And so, why do some people preach only half Christ's message? He said, repent and believe. We must turn from sin as well as turn to Christ. Otherwise, we are guilty of idolatry. We're, because we're afraid of offending a sinful world that is either ignorant of or has willfully already rejected um, uh, God's moral law. Romans 1.18, the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And this is why we want to talk about the love of God, but not the wrath of God. This is why we want to talk about the help of God, but not the holiness of God. We talk about benefits, but not expectations. We want people to sign up, but not sell out. But the very first thing that Christ called for was people to sell out. Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What would a profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life or forfeits his soul? You see, grace is free, but it wasn't cheap. It cost Christ his life. You know, God gave us his very best. 
Amen? And I think it's important for us to understand that, you know, God forbid that we should do any less for him. Amen? And so in light of this question, um, you, you know, in light of this, the question really is, is the Bible a manual on how to be happy or how to be holy? Well, personally, I believe it's both. Um, Psalm 128 tells us, Um, verse 1 and 2, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. I believe that's holiness. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy and it shall be well with you. That's holiness. I mean, sorry, that's happiness. Verse 1 deals with holiness. Verse 2 deals with happiness. Our problem is we put it the other way around. We want to be happy. And so the husband says, well, I have to leave my wife because I have to be happy. No, you don't, dummy. And you're not going to be happy. The grass is always greener on the other side. Fact is, you're a fool. Because you're breaking a covenant in the eyes of God. And you're inviting destruction into your life. The Bible says, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The wages of sin are always death. It doesn't matter, you know, sometimes you don't get those wages at the end of a month or the end of a year, but it will come. Be faithful to your wife. Be faithful to your husband. Don't allow the enemy to whisper in your ear and lie to you. And so it will be, you will be happy. You will never be happy if you are not holy. You see, if holiness therefore is an essential aspect of God's character, then surely as leaders, we have a responsibility to call people to live holy lives. As the worship group come forward. And yet, sadly, this is often neglected. Like I said, maybe it's out of fear of offending or losing members or the worst crime of all in the modern church, which is to be uncool and appear to be out of touch. You see, God's ways do not change. People say to me sometimes, well, pastor, the world is changing. God's word does not change. It says that in Malachi chapter 3. It says, I, the Lord, do not change. God doesn't change. The world may change. But we have to stay faithful to God's word and to God's ways. And God's way is holiness. We must determine to walk in that highway of holiness irrespective of what the world may do. Irrespective of what becomes politically correct or culturally accepted or culturally palatable. It does not matter. We must walk on that highway of holiness even if nobody else does. God is a holy God. We must be holy too. Stand to your feet today. Isaiah 30, verse 20. The Lord will give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. But your teacher will no longer hide himself. With your own eyes, you will see him. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. But we have that promise. That if we will deal with our sin... If we will surrender ourselves to him, claim the cleansing power of his precious blood, that we will see him in our life, in our home, in our marriage, in our children. And whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear the command behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. So you will desecrate your silver-plated idols and your gold-plated images. You will throw them away like menstrual cloths, saying, Be gone. You will hear a command saying, this is the way. What way is that? The way of holiness. The call of God down through the ages has not changed. It is still, be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. With every head bowed and every eye closed for one moment. I just want you to take a moment to search your heart. As we stand at the beginning of a new year it's always a good opportunity to reflect you know the book of Sam says search me and know my heart test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting and so I know there are people here today and I know you have bondages and issues and some of you it's been generational your father was an alcoholic your grandfather was one and, and, and you're struggling with the same bondage you're struggling some of you are struggling with the very same thing that as a child you said I will never do 
And yet there is an iniquity at work. There's a bondage that is at work and God wants you to be free. And I'm not, I don't have time to call people up to the front today. But I believe the Spirit of the Lord is here. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. With every head bowed, every eye closed, take a moment to search your heart and ask yourself, is there an area of darkness in my life? Is there an area where God wants to set me free? Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe, like I said, it's, it's an addiction to, you know, to, to alcohol or porn or drugs. Or, or, or maybe it's just a tendency to feel sorry for yourself. Maybe you're struggling with depression, despair, panic attacks. I don't know what it is. This is not about embarrassing you. But if there's some area in your life where you want to be set free, just lift your hand to the Lord right now before Him in Jesus' name. Just as an acknowledgement, just acknowledge that. Amen. Just have the humility to acknowledge it before the Lord in Jesus' name. Just close your eyes. This is, we're not going to bring anybody up here. The Lord is going to touch you right where you are in Jesus' name. And so just acknowledge that before the Lord, whatever that may be. Maybe somebody spoke something maybe it's many many years ago and yet that thing was like a dagger in your heart and you carry that unforgiveness and the Bible talks about a root of bitterness taking hold and so today the Lord wants to take that arrow out of your heart he wants to break that chain he wants to lift that burden he wants to set the captive free in Jesus name and so today in his presence just lift that thing up to him whatever it is you're struggling with right now lift it up to him and the Lord is going to bring freedom because where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty God wants you to walk in liberty. God wants you to be free from that offense, free from that bitterness, free from that iniquity in the name of Jesus Christ. And just pray this to me right now. Say, Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, say it out loud. Lord Jesus Christ. Say it like you mean it. Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for the blood that cleansed me. I thank you for taking my place on that cross. And I ask, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would set me free. That you would heal my heart. That you would break that chain. You came to set the captives free. And I ask you today, Lord, set me free. In the name of Jesus, set me free, Lord. You came that I would be free. Satan, you have no place in my life. Your power is broken over me. Jesus is my Lord. And I'm walking free today. I surrender this to you, Lord. I surrender my heart to you, Lord. I surrender my home to you, Lord. Do you want to do in my life this year? In Jesus' name. I receive freedom. I receive forgiveness. I receive cleansing. I receive deliverance. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give a shout of praise to the Lord.